All right. Thank you. That's a good start. So, um, I'll do a quick, a quick introduction. Uh, my name is Kajan Kostar. I do Java by trade. I'm married. I have two kids. I live in Delft. I ride motorcycle. This is actually my previous one. I have the same again. So woo -hoo. And I like big systems. That's what I do for a living is I contract myself out to people who have big systems and accompanying big problems. I like those. Sorry? In Delft. In Delft, Holland. Yeah. Beautiful city. If you're ever bored, you want to go someplace, it's like small Amsterdam without the drugs. And today we are going to talk about uh, Java bytecode engineering. And Java bytecode engineering is, I think, is a very important topic, not for you guys to start doing this and run it in production. Yeah, that's not the purpose of this talk. The purpose of this talk is to get you guys started so you can start understanding what's beneath all that cruft that you download every time you run Maven. Yeah? So all the abstraction takes us away from what Java really is, which is a virtual machine that can run instructions. And it really helps for developers to understand what happens on that level so that you can explain a few problems better. Yeah? So this is to get you guys started. There's a lot of stuff. This is usually a two-hour talk, so um, I need to get going. So what we're going to do today, we're going to look at a workflow for people developing Java bytecode. And we're looking at tools that can help you in that tool chain. So Java P, BCLifier, some other tools we'll, we'll pass along. And we'll look at the architecture of the JVM, so the runtime architecture that you have to deal with when you do bytecode engineering. I'm going to try and make things nice and small so you can get started easily. Yeah, it's not going to be complete, so this is where you start experimenting. So one of the things I was told is you have to start with why. And the reason sometimes you have to get into bytecode engineering, this is one of the reasons, is that the Java language doesn't allow you to use everything that the JVM can do, right? So just to be clear, the Java runtime has more ability to execute code than Java allows you to express. And in one instance, I was working on, um, pardon my French, the, the BrainFuck compiler, and I was adding concurrency to it. And at that point, the BrainFuck is a very, very tiny language, and you really need every byte you can get. Yeah, the, the original compiler was 200 bytes, all of it, for the entire language. And I was building one in Java, and obviously it's going to be bigger. Um, but one of the things I needed was concurrency without the threads. I mean, if you instantiate a thread in Java, you're looking at one and a half megabytes just for the thread itself. And then there's stacks and there's other overhead. So you don't want to do that when you want you know, a million, two million threads. And there's this thing called um, cooperative multitasking. And what you can do is very simple. You've got a switch case which helps you remember where you were in the code. And when you yield, you return the value of where you want to jump into. Now, don't read this code too much. I want to demonstrate something that Java cannot do, but C, and actually the JVM, can do. So the code you see on the screen, is there anything special about it? I've tried it, yep. Sorry? Chicken set? No, not really. This is a, it's a syntax problem that I'm looking for. So if you look at this code with the C glasses on, this is perfectly fine. If you look at the code with Java glasses on, there is a problem. Um, notice that there is a case in the middle of that else block, yeah, which in C is perfectly fine. And in Java, you can only nest these. You cannot interleave them. This is essentially an expression of, of go to that we don't have in Java. So if you want to write this code, you're going to have to resort to not using Java. Switch to C, or in my case, switch to bytecode engineering. Yeah, so this is the reason I got started on bytecode engineering, because there was something I couldn't express in Java that I still wanted to use. Don't do this at home. Bad idea. Still useful. All right, so this, this is the workflow that you're in when you're doing bytecode engineering. And it's a little different from your average development cycle. 
Average development cycle means you compile something, you debug it, compile it, debugging, probably write test cases, probably read the specs occasionally. With bytecode engineering, it's a little different. So what you want to try is as much as possible not to do bytecode engineering, because it's really, really hard and tricky. So what you want to do is you write everything you can in Java. As far as it will go, you write it in Java. And if now your problem is solved, you're done, and you forget about bytecode engineering. But if it's not, at that point, you have to start decompiling your code, understanding what it is that you are lacking, and then tweaking those bytecodes. You've got to go in and change the individual instructions as generated by the Java compiler and make them do what you want to do. Yeah? So where the, no the normal development fl flow, it means source code and you compile, debug, compile, debug. Now you have try to get as far as you can in Java, and then at some point you're going to have to switch to sort of a tweaking cycle. And there are tools for this, and I'll go over them real brief. Um, they're sorted by usability, right? Usability max on this land, and hardest to use on that end. Uh, so Spring, AOP, if it's useful, you can instrument code, you can add annotations. There's lots of ways that Spring allows you to express things that are otherwise quite hard to do. Then you go into Aspect J, which gives you a little finer grain control, and then finally you get the, the four on the, your right um, are the ones that are actually uh, bytecode libraries. So Java sys starts, it has a Java E syntax, so it's nice and easy for Java developers. And then from CGLib, BCL, ASM, and then probably a few that I've forgotten, those are the ones that where you actually manip manipulate the individual bytes. Yeah, so try to stay on that left side of the diagram, and you'll be forced by your problem to, uh, to uh, go to the right at some point. All right, this is something you've all learned because you, you guys all have your Java certification, but just you know, to remind yourself. So when a class file is loaded into the JVM, it's essentially a stream of bytes. Yeah, and this is the example that I give, and it starts with the signifying cafe baby. That's the marker that says this is a Java byte stream. That Java byte stream is then as just as a file read into the JVM, and it runs through a verifier. The verifier that checks the sandbox and makes sure that your code actually adheres to the JVM spec. Verifier is very important because it's the final check. After that, you're home free. You can do whatever you like. Before the verifier, you've got to adhere to the Java spec. Once verified, the code goes into class loaders. You guys have worked with class loaders, I presume, and they produce the class file, the, the class object, which then produce the instances of the objects. Yeah, so this is the, the step-by-step methodology you have to keep in mind. So what we want to do is we want to change that stream of bytes in a way that it does what we want it to do. And if you look at it from a different angle, you can see there's the marker and there's some version information. And this is what a class file looks like if you open it up on disk. It has a version number, the constants, the access flags, class info, fields, methods, and code. Yeah? And then if you look at the JVM, when it runs code, it's actually a stack machine. How many people here have done assembler on any architecture? All right, you're the right crowd. Cool. So if you've got any Spark Assembler under your belt, you will see a passing familiarity between Spark Assembler and the JVM. It's, it's fairly obvious both were from Sun. Yeah, but it doesn't mean it's the same thing. It's just that sometimes you go, hey, oh, I noticed that. If you've done any other assembler, the JVM will look very familiar. I mean, it's just instructions. There's a stack. There's odd things that you have to deal with as you do in assembler. So how does that stack work? And I've, uh, this, I was bored on a plane, so I, I made this. So there's an instruction point. It's very simple. This is, how all, this is how your Intel CPU also works, right? The physical machine, not the virtual machine. You've got an instruction point. You've got a bunch of instructions that need to be executed. And they're just the instruction point that tells you where you were. It pushes one on the stack. What we're going to do is we're going to add one and two and see how much comes out. All right, that's, that's the work we're going to do here. So whatever is on the stack, it pushes a one on top of it, and it pushes the two on top of it, 
and then it executes the iAd function. And the iAd function takes two integers off the stack and puts the result back on. Yeah, on hardware machines, you typically see they read from register A, one or two registers, and writes in another register, and the JVM works much more stack-centered than uh, a hardware machine does. Okay? And this is essentially all the JVM does all day long. Take stuff off the stack, put it back, put results back, duplicate stuff, that's all that happened. If you want to read what instructions are there, this is a good place to start. The JVM spec is surprisingly readable. So if you go into this stuff, you know, grab a cup of coffee or something else and just read this stuff. It's really interesting, well written, you know, it's not something that puts you to sleep. So I want to go to, uh, I'm, I'm hurrying a bit because I want to give you guys some actual bytecode to look at. Um, I'm going to be demonstrating three tools now. These are important tools. You've got your Java P, which has, is for the learning use case where you just have a problem and you just want to know what really happens. You know, not something that you can figure out with test cases. You just really want to know what it is that the JVM is doing. I will demonstrate the BCLifier, which is a very, very nice tool to get you started with bytecode engineering, and the BCL verifier, which is sort of a standalone version of the verifier that's inside the JVM. And the latter is for linting. So you can go through your code and make sure that you didn't make any mistakes. So if you look at the workflow, Java P is just a decompiler, right? The, the tweak cycle, it doesn't help you. It gives you insight in what a class is, and there it ends. So let's look at some code with, the, with Java P. Uh, here we switch. All right, so dropping down the command line, we're going to look at some classes. I've written a few classes, and I've um, compiled them. And I'll show you the Java code, and then I'll decompile them for you and ask a few questions. So let's start with, um, and let me see, Java P, and then we go to Hello World. Yeah, the first line of code you ever write in any language, does it work? Yeah, simple Hello World printing. So Java P has a minus V flag with the Java P has a minus V flag, which is sort of, give me everything I probably want to know about that class. And you'll notice that, hello world, I pass in the class name. Yeah, so the Java P works on a class level. It doesn't work with the file. It expects that to be able to load that class from disk on the class path. And it just so happens that the current directory is in the class path. So boom, there you go, code. So this is a view of that file. If you remember that block with Cafe Baby at the start and then the fields, this is essentially a representation of that, starting with the constant pool. And here, down here, you've got your methods. This is a constructor, which I didn't declare. It still got generated. And the main method here. And then there's code. And let's look at the code. So what this does, it puts something it says get static, give me a static method, put it on the stack where it belongs. Then we load a constant, LDC stands for load constant, which is the string, this comment is helpful. Yeah, it tells you a little bit about what's going on. It loads constant number 22, and if you refer back to the constant pool, you'll find it's actually a reference to 23, which is a UTF-8 string, hello world. And then finally, it invokes a method, the method that's on the stack, actually, with the parameters on the stack, and finally returns from this method. Is this clear? Any questions about this? Cool. Let's look at some other code. So have you guys, how do you, how do you know, um, have you guys looked at the try-catch? So I've made a class, try-catch which has a main method again, and it prints out hello world, and it has a finally block, which prints out finally. All right, picture yourself on a stack machine and try to figure out, okay, so what is this code gonna look like? Java P minus V, try catch. Yeah? 
So I'm going to jump straight into the main method. The rest is more or less the same as the previous one. And something very interesting happens. Uh, here you see your hello world, but hey, that finally string is actually loaded twice. Why is that, you think? Yes, so you've got the happy case, you've got the exception case, good point. Yeah, so what the JVM actually does, it generates code paths for both explicitly. Cool, huh? So now you get code duplication. If you have a big finally block with complex stuff in it, you get it twice. What if we take that try catch and then nest it a little bit? Yeah, so now I've got hello world, which has a finally, which has a finally, which has a finally. What do you think will happen? Should we look? So here's your hello world being loaded and executed. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six finallys for every possible code path. Cool, huh? So here you can see stuff that's in the JVM. It's not in the JVM spec. The finally block is not in JVM spec. That's a compiler thing. It's being generated for you. It's something that it, it's, it's based on your code, but the JVM itself doesn't understand finally. It's just a, that's a Java thing. It's not a JVM thing. And it's funny when you start working with this that you start splitting the two, the JVM and the Java language. They sort of fall apart into two categories, which previously probably there were one in your head. Let's look at some more code. So, ah, there's this one. I'll, make, I'll start with this one. Anybody know Joss Bloch? Yeah, you, everything from Joss Bloch, make sure you, you read it and see it. So the question here is this return quiz method, what value is being returned? Three, 42, five, or something else, and why? Anyone? Five. All right, we've got one for five. Anyone else? Another five. Okay, everybody's on five. You guys have seen Joss Bloch, probably. So in this case, you can guess, you can argue about it, you can reason about it, but the nice thing about it is you can just look at the code. So try catch quiz, it's called. Let's decompile it and see. So we've got our method return quiz. And what it does, with a little bit of fiddling, don't ask me why it does this, is it says go to 8, and then there's some code which results in loading iconst 5. So the answer is it'll return 5. In fact, everything else is being compiled away. It's being thrown away by the compiler. Because the compiler knows that the end result of this is going to be 5. Yeah, so if you look at the code again, the finally block says return five. So whatever you returned in other stuff, you can safely ignore as a compiler. And the compiler optimizes that away. And interesting as well, you see there is a, an instruction for the JVM just to put a five on the stack. Yeah, and there's an instruction for the zero, the one, the, 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 just a few smaller numbers that everybody knows you're going to use a million times in a normal program. They have their own little instruction just so you can save a couple of bytes loading on disk in memory to have that instruction simplified. Yeah, so in this case, when Josh asks this question of you, don't think about it, decompile and read the code. Is there any code that any of you would like to see that you're wondering how it would work? Uh, you know, not JDBC, that's a bit too big, but things like this. How's the time? Reflection. All right. Uh, I actually have an example of reflection for a later demo, and I'll show you that. So here's a class, hello, again. And this one is special because what it does, it doesn't just print hello world. It actually gets the declared fields of the object itself and prints them out. We'll use that in a later demo. OK? So I'll decompile this and have a look-see, OK? So we go into that, uh, I think, where is that? 
the hello Java P class path bin uh, or and the minus V is missing. All right. So what does reflection look like? So here's your hello world again. And then what we do is we get the class and we get the declared fields. And these are just virtual methods that are being invoked from the bytecode. And then down here, we've got a string builder. And as you'll note, I don't use string builders in my code. Yeah, I just have a simple string concatenation. There's no string builder. But the Java compiler is smart enough since whatever, I think six or seven, smart enough to think, hey, let's use a string builder. So all that time you spent writing string builders, Wasted. Good things. So the string builder here is made, and it is initialized, and then the string is appended. And finally, that string is too stringed and put out on the screen. So this is what a reflection looks like. It's just methods being invoked on an object, which just happened to be the this pointer. Yeah? This is how clean the language is in a sense, that reflection is not something, some special sauce. It's just methods that you call on object. Cool, huh? Anything else? Mm. Let's see, so it, it is actually being used in a loop here, but it's not being appended to, uh, but it's, it, let me see, because uh, I think what happens here is that it returns to line number 31. So what happens here is that if you look at the loop, it starts sort of around here, and it ends sort of around here. This is the, the condition, the loop condition being checked. And it jumps back to 31. And you can see that it does the new instruction for the string builder on each iteration. So it, it doesn't reuse the, uh, the object. OK? There's another talk that I do about memory allocation where I show that it's a good thing it doesn't reuse that. But that's another topic. Yeah, so you would like to see what plus IC? Yeah, let's write some code about that. So we'll go to um, hello world, screw up hello world a bit. So. So I do a try catch. Nice big one. Uh, so e dot print stack trace, right? So here we do a throw new IO exception. Something like this, right? Oh, I O error. No, let's make an exception. And see what the message is. Oh, yeah. All right. So now we force an I O exception. Okay. So now I need to go back to Java P. Java P minus V. Um, hello world. That's the one, right? So let's look at what happens here. We've got the string being pushed on the stack and printed. Then we invoke the new. Note that here on a virtual machine, on the, on the instruction level, we have an instruction to create objects, which is not normal. I mean, memory allocation is an application level thing for physical processors. For the JVM, it's actually a JVM thing, the virtual machine thing. 
So the I exception is created and a second instance of it, so a second reference to it is put on the stack. And then we call the initializer and then finally we throw it. So this is a bit tricky. What we do is we create a new exception object. We have a reference to it on the stack. And then we duplicate that reference. So now we have two pointers to the same object. The first reference is being used to call the initializer, the constructor. The second reference is being called with the a-throw. Yeah? And then the a-throw causes an exception to be raised, which goes to target line number 18. Target line number 18 is this one, where we store the this pointer, and then we invoke the exception. Yeah, so the exception, the JVM is aware of exceptions, just not of the finally blocks. Okay? Cool stuff. All right. So now what I want to show you is, um, this, this was a tool that puts you um, here, right? You decompile, but you can't do anything with the code. You can't enter the tweak cycle with this. So you need a tool that helps you enter that tweak cycle, and that is what BCLifier does for you. And the BCLifier is something, bear with me. So the BCLifier takes a class file and then generates a Java class, or Java program actually in Java, uh, that if you run it, will generate the original class. Yeah, you still with me? Should I say that again? I'll say it again. So BCLifier takes a class, you run it, it produces a program that, when you run that program, produces the original class. Yeah? Good, you all understood. I'll uh, show it. Let me see. So, we start with an empty directory. We start with a program, hello.java. Can you guys see my cursor? Yeah. So, uh, this is class hello, which has a pub static void main string args. You've written this code, yeah? And it says system.out.print ln hello. Um, kind of like this, right? We compile this, java c hello.java. Yeah, now we have a Java program and its class file in class files. And we can dump this file, java p minus v hello, and it'll show what we've just written. Ta -da. And now enter BCLifier. And since the command line is a bit complex, I made a script, so BCLifier on hello. All right. What I'll do is I'll output that to a file. Hello, create. Yeah, so the BCLifier takes a class file and produces a Java program. And because it's unreadable, if you put, use it on a terminal, I'm going to go here in uh, Eclipse and show you guys, where's BCL, show you guys. So I refresh, load the code into the IDE, and we're going to have to look at the hello creator. Okay, quite readable, right? So what BCL does is a bytecode engineering library. That's the name, B-C-E-L, bytecode engineering library. And what it allows you to do, it's a pure Java library. It allows you to read class files, manipulate them, and write them back out. Or generate class files from scratch. And that's the example we're giving here. And it needs some stuff like the factories and class gen, etc. And things get a bit hairy, but after a while, so we've got something that says create method zero. Okay, let's read create method zero. What do you guys think it is? Yeah, if you look at the method gen, what, what method is being generated here? Trick question. Main? It says init, right? The init method is a special name for the constructor. 
So this is where we generate a constructor. Yeah? And all it does, it does the super invocation. Right? Super, bracket, bracket. That translates to calling on object, which is our parent class, the init method. And then there's a second create method one, which produces a method called main, here you see the name, to a class hello, that has uh, string arguments. Yeah, so we took the original class file, produced something that can produce the original class. So now what I can do, Java C, hello world creator. Hello, creator. Java. Oh, wait. Um, I have to pass in the BCL library itself so it can actually resolve. Yeah? So now what we have the original class file and Java code, and we've got the hello world creator. What I'm going to do now. I'm going to remove the original hello world, so now all we have is the creator, right? I'm now entering the tweak cycle. So the original code is gone. And I run the creator, hello, um, and for that I need again, let me reuse some stuff to, uh, so now I'm going to run, oh wait, the origin, the creator. And if you look at the file that was generated, it's called hello.class. Yeah? So now we have the original file. It was produced by our creator, except now we produce the class file not via the Java compiler from our own source code, but we produce it by generating individual bytecodes and putting those into BCL. And now we're going to tweak it. I like tweaking. So for example, Hmm, what could I do? I could, for example, take this bit, which seems long, but it's just a method invocation. Give it a new name. System out println, what shall we print? Hello, audience. Yeah? So what I've done now is I've changed the creator to produce bytecode for the main method to print two things, not one. The original hello is still here and it's being produced, and I have a hello audience after that. So now I can rerun the hello creator, and I can use Java. Whoa, what did I do wrong? I didn't compile it, thank you. That's the one, thank you. Uh, and I have to run it again. And now I should finally... No! What am I doing wrong? Help me out, audience. So I've got the hello creator. Uh, yeah, this, uh, this is a bit tricky because it makes an instruction list which then adds to a global object. So the code is kind of nasty. And the instruction list is used here, so this instruction handle is actually not being used. This is not the nicest code. Yeah, so it uses global objects, which for the purpose of what we're trying to do is actually fine. I did save it. I compiled the Hello World Creator. Um, I think Eclipse, no, I think Eclipse is in the way, wait. Probably Eclipse still, still thinks the hello class is still there and it's trying to compile it. So if I refresh it. And now we run the hello creator. And now we run hello, please work, please work. All right, sorry guys, this was supposed to be a useful demo, yeah. Sure. You're right, thank you. 
All right. Welcome in Byteco land. Yeah? Thank you. <laughs> it's so embarrassing. Don't do live coding, guys. It's a bad idea. All right. Thank you. <laughs> so, and, uh, and now I'm curious uh, about uh, the code. So as you go through this, it's very easy to, as I've just demonstrated accidentally, uh, write the wrong code, but it's also easy to write illegal code because the JVM doesn't just allow anything. Whereas the physical processors actually accept random garbage as instructions, the JVM has very clear guidelines and rules over what your program can do. So you can run a verifier on it. And the, the verifier, like most things, uh, run on the class bytes, not on the, so on the class file, not on the source code. So I've got a script that I've named verifier. What it does, it invokes a standalone verifier on the code we've just pr produced. Yeah, so it's verifying hello, and it passes a few tests. And I honestly don't know what all of these do, but what it does now, it, it looks at your code and compares it to the JVM spec and says, yes, this class is in spec or out of spec. And it actually produces two warnings to help you improve your code. Yeah, so you can use this as a linting tool. You can use the JVM as a linting tool, because if you start it and it won't load, you get a verification error. It's a very clear exception from the class loaders you get. Yeah, so this is a very useful tool to get started. OK. Any questions about this? Yeah? So if you look at the other tools like ASM, for example, they have their own AC ASM fire, which I haven't used. So I don't know which one is better. Uh, this is the first one I used, and I liked it. Uh, and I'm sure there are many tools that can do it. If you look at Eclipse, although the version of Eclipse uh, that I run doesn't support them, uh, there are a number of visual uh, plugins to show you the bytecode. So if you, I'm sure the other IDEs will have something similar. So you can look at the bytecode using Java P, which is kind of rough. Uh, but there are actually visual representations, and some of them even them do some form of flow analysis where they show how the branches work and how the code, how loops work, etc. Yeah, the fact that the JVM, sorry, the Java compiler produces fairly predictable code helps these plugins because they know, okay, so if these three instructions are put together, it probably means this. So they can do a get a lot of intelligence and do a lot of intelligent things with the output. All right, so if you look at the workflow, BCLifier allows you to do the full step, as does ASM, and I'm sure other tools as well. All right, if there are no further questions, I want to dive into the, another very important tool to the JVM, and that's the instrumentation API. And the instrumentation API is a very, very powerful extension to, uh, to the class loading cycle that allows you to do really, really cool and bizarre stuff. And it's full, full Java, fully supported, well documented, specified even, so you can use it safely. So remember this picture. You've got your bytes codes coming in, and there's the verifier and the class loader, blah, blah, blah. So what you can do, you can actually, as the JVM starts up, you can specify what is called an agent. And an agent has special powers, especially in Java land. What you can do is you can specify an agent, and that gives you the ability to transform the classes that are coming in. Yeah? So the bytes are coming from disk, and they go, and I'll show this in this picture, actually, it's, it's easier to show. The bytes are coming from disk, they go into a transformer, and the transformer is your agent. Your agent is given the stream of bytes as an array, actually, it's very simple, and you're just going to have to make do with the array, and you're going to have to give something back to the JVM, which is then passed to the verifier, and the class loader. The simplest use case is you just return that original array that was given to you and the whole thing works. It's just that all the classes that are loaded pass through your hands, which is kind of cool. So if you just print out the name of those classes, that's already quite, because literally hundreds and thousands of classes are passing through your hands at that point. Yeah? You've got to realize that those transformers live in sort of a twilight zone in the JVM. You guys, if you've never done this, you're probably used to things like exceptions, you know, nice things as logging. Those things don't exist in the Twilight Zone. 
There is no class path. Your pre the main hasn't started yet. Your application server that's probably going to be started, you know, eons from now, isn't there yet. The class bytes for that for the Tomcat is not available. You can't do anything. All of that stuff comes in. And if you touch something the wrong way, if you get a, a graphics class from Apple, for example, in your hands, you change it and then you load it, your JVM just dies. And it, you know, it can give you the silent treatment where things just don't work. You have no idea why. And then what it can do is can bomb out. It's you know, bus error, pfft, core dump. Nothing like, you know, logger stack trace, etc. So what you've got to do here is you've got to tread lightly when you're a transformer. You've got to make sure that if you're touching something, you touch it the right way. And if you don't know what it is, just pass it along and pretend it never happened. And don't expect any help from the JVM. Things die in curious ways. So here, if you look at what the transformer does, it, you can see um, the colors aren't too bright, but if you look at the transformer, you can see that it passes on a different array, slightly different from the previous one. It still has Cafe Baby, the header, etc. It's just that some of the bytes have been changed. The verifier verifies that, the class loader loads it, and then you end up with a class that is amended, that has a little thing on it. It's kind of cool. Yeah? Suddenly, you can change classes that come into the runtime, even classes from vendors or from the JVM itself. And the objects that are generated from that class have a thingamabob on them too. Maybe it's an actual logger field Yeah, for tracing. You can actually add that kind of stuff as you go along. So let's look at some code for this. So we've done BCL. We've done... I've done the uh, hello demonstration, so I can go right into this one. So let's look at what this looks like. So what we're going to do is we're going to instrument the hello class that's being loaded, and we're going to log extra information about it. Yeah, so we're going to do some aspect-oriented programming, which in any way is a lot simpler than we're going to do it now. We're going to find the most difficult way to do it, but the most powerful way. Pre-main. So if you look, you can see that I implement an interface called class file transformer. Right? That's the transformer. Class file transformers are given all the bytes that go into the JVM. You have a pre-main, which is executed pre-main, hence the name. And there you register the fact, and you'll notice I'm quite chatty here, and I'm not using logger frameworks, I'm using system out, because it's there. Everything else is not loaded yet, right? You may not have your graphics environment yet, you don't know. So don't do difficult things here. Just print, hey, I'm here, be chatty, so you know it happened, and you have to sh uh, put a shutdown hook in place, which will unload everything again. And then you add your transformer, yourself as a transformer, to the instrumentation, which hooks you into the, the, the darkest corners of the JVM. And then this method is being called. And you can see the transform method, it needs to return an array of bytes, and it's given an array of bytes. And it's in its simplest form, all you have to do is return the bytes. And if anything looks like maybe it's a system class from Apple or Apache or anywhere else, don't touch it. Yeah, so it, I just, it, it's a very crude implementation. Uh, but if anything looks like this, I'm going to ignore it, and I'm going to just return the original class byte, byte. If it looks like something we can use, we'll start instrumenting that class. And here, what I do is I now build an internal model of that class. And this, this code that you're looking at is not from BCL that I've demonstrated before, but it is from um, Java Assist, which is another nice bytecode engineering library. And it allows you to get that bytes and interpret those as though it was an object. So this kind of analog to the class object that you're used to in Java, but it's different in the sense that you can actually manipulate it and you can change the code and add stuff to it, which you can't in the original Java. So if it looks like an interface, don't touch it. If it is the hello class, then we're going to instru instru instrument it. Otherwise, don't touch it. So if the name looks a lot like this, 
then yes, we're going to implement it. And what we're uh, instrumenting, what we're going to do is we're going to actually make a field. And Java Assist is nice because it allows you, thank you, it allows you um, to write Java in Java, right? So this is a string. This is not Java source code. This is something that looks a lot like Java that uh, Java Assist understands. So you can forego individual instructions, which is kind of nice. You could, at this point, use BCL to do the same thing and just in add the inst individual instructions to the stream, which would also work. Um, but this is just a tad more readable. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add a static field called under under logger. And this is you know, the first problem, or pff, first of many. Uh, you've got to pick a name that's not conflicting with the names that are already there. Yeah, because otherwise you screw up the code. So you've got to think of something odd. Use dollar signs, use bizarre stuff, generate them on the timestamp, I don't know. S think of something. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take the uh, hello method and I'm going to add info logging to the beginning and end of it so that I can see that hello method is being entered or not. Yeah? So what we do is we take the object, the bytecode, make it into an object, add code to it, put it back, go through the verifier, load it into the system. And then finally, we have to do a little bit, a bit of bookkeeping where we say, well, in the manifest file, hey, there's this pre-main class that you need to load before the main. And then uh, our dear JVM knows what to do. And we've got to put Java Assist in there as well. And immediately, we're stuck because Hibernate uses Java Assist and probably a different version from the one I have. So if you're loading this into a production system, you will get all kinds of weird behavior with different versions of libraries. So good luck with that. Um, it pays not to do any of this stuff quite well. So let's run the hello method that we have here. It's, it's a complicated version of hello, because what I want to do is I want to show you a few things of the demo. So first it prints hello world, and then it gets the declared fields, and it prints out which fields are declared. Yeah, so I'll switch to the terminal again. Uh, hello. Java hello. Uh, Oh yeah, ja Java man, come on, cp dot org. So it prints out hello world, and it prints out that it has two fields, an int field and an other int field. Yeah, and those, if you look at the code, are these two referred to here. Yeah, so you can see they are actually two fields. Now, if I go to the instrumentation uh, program, I can build the jar file and I can run hello again with the agent in memory. And then what we see is that here we see, hey, the pre-main started. Remember, the agent is chatty, so we know what happens. It instruments the hello class. And then from here, it now calls entering method hello. And this is our code working. Yeah? This is the additional code that we instrumented from the... And it only exists at runtime. If I look at the class file, it still only has the two fields. If I run it with the agent, it has three fields. Note field, static field, and this under, under logger thing. Yeah? So it literally added the field to the class before, uh, before loading it. All right, any questions about this? What would you like to see? The run script, of course. Uh, so the run script, what it does is set, set some path, but what it does, it creates a jar file with the extra manifest items, and then on the Java command line, we pass in this little bit. Minus Java agent agent.jar. And that's the point where the JVM knows, okay, so I need to open this file. There's a manifest which says pre-main, and then it goes into the code and starts instrumenting. 
Yeah? The instrumentation API, and it's beyond the scope of this talk, but the instrumentation API also allowed, allows you to do hot code reloading. So you can actually take a loaded class, unload it, and put your new version back in place. Things like JRebel uh, use that or use that. Maybe they have a, a better method. But that's the entry point for uh, debuggers and for hot code reloading, maybe in your own code, which is kind of cool. All right. And with that, uh, the final thing, if you're entering this world, uh, don't say I didn't warn you. So. Any final questions? Yes? None at all. So, um, <laughs> um, there, if you are, uh, peop your people like J Rebel will have, or if you're building Hibernate, yeah, the, the actual framework, then at that point you need to do this kind of stuff. Honestly, I can't think, and of the systems I build, uh, they're big, but they're in, the sa in a sense simple, that they don't need this kind of stuff. Yeah, maintainability goes whoop, out the window, and uh, so what, what I do is I, I expect people to work with me to be able to, to reason about it, to understand it. So I use this as a teaching tool. Yeah to show what happens, like with the finally block, like exception handling, so like the fact that the JVM has a new method as the first class citizen. So those are the things I think are important to know so that then you can forget them and build good code. Okay, yes. It, yeah, it would be tricky because you have the code reloading uh, option that you could do. So you would have to prepare for this and you need quite a bit of knowledge of your system. But theoretically, yes. Uh, I, you know, you'd be pretty awesome if you actually did it. So uh, let me know. But yes, what you could do is take a class out that you know is problematic, replace it with one that has extra instrumentation and logging, and then do that a few times until you zoom in on the problem. That's something you might be able to do. Lots of ifs and buts, but it would be pretty awesome. Then, uh, if there, do you have a question? No further questions, and thank you for your time. <laughs>